Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break. Today we are really talking about coffee and I have some internet royalty with me. So somebody who is in the business for a very long time, has tons of experience with e-commerce, with digital marketing, and we just pick his brain a little bit on what's happening right now and how he basically started, got started and where he is now today. So just to not longer keep it a secret, it's Phil Kiprianio. He is a serial entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience in e-commerce and digital marketing. He's also the founder of multiple six and seven figure e-commerce store, inclu including Goth Rider Badass Coffee. So with that, hello, Phil, how are you today? Hey, 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 hi, Klaus. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. I was really looking forward to you uh, having you here. So give me a bit of a background. You're in the business for a long time. Yeah, Where yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I started, you know, uh, doing business, uh, you know, over 20 years ago now. So uh, I went through multiple, you know, ventures uh, from recording studio, owning a recording label, signing artists also to major labels and um, ran internet radio back then, um, doing events, multiple also kind of events uh, we, we, we did during that time. So seeing, you know, a bunch of different ways of marketing, uh, you know, owning also, you know, by owning an internet radio by side back then, we we're owning also like kind of blog magazines. So, you know, how to monetize that, how to monetize internet radio, um, then later on, you know, moved to uh, build a performance agency back in 2008, uh, where we started doing like lead generation for mortgage company, insurance company, uh, car dealership and all this kind of thing. Uh, up to, I would say like um, 2015, where I really um, started to uh, get my expertise, digital marketing expertise into e-commerce. And um, that's where everything changed. And I had a very big passion, first of all, for e-commerce, selling online. Um, and basically that, uh, you know, brought me from selling T-shirt online before, tw uh, before like 2015 with Teesprings, like a lot of people out there learning the skills, you know, um, and then, you know, with dropshipping, when dropshipping came, you know, very popular was just before the... The, the head of the curve. So uh, I had a chance, you know, to, um, to get, uh, I would say like lucky back, back then because, you know, everything was much more easier than it is right now. Like, you know, uh, you know, cost to acquire customers were cheap. You know, it was easy to drop ship from China uh, and people also uh, customers were new as well to that form of buying online, which is now uh, very common. So been in the golden days <laughs> and um, basically, you know, through, through all those experience, um, that's where also, you know, uh, Godfather came, you know, a bit like uh, uh, out of nowhere, you know, I was drop shipping uh, from a general store, uh, owning 10 stores at that time. And there was always one that was keeping up and, you know, oh, I mean, this one, you know, always performs better, easier. I have like right demographic, right products and all this kind of thing. And basically, uh, I turned that into a brand. It was not a brand uh, at the beginning. Um, we were also mostly selling jewelry, accessories for bikers and things like that. And short, short story, uh, we in 2020, that's really where things changed with COVID. Um, I, I had um, uh, an agency performance, again, agency, but based on growth for e-commerce, where I was consulting, much more consulting like uh, e-com businesses. And there was like that coffee uh, brand that was there like for 15 years, we became friends. And I said, you know, out of nowhere, you know, it would be great maybe, you know, to see if, you know, I can test coffee to my niche, uh, to, my, to my brand and see if that works. And basically... Um, we, it took like three weeks, you know, to figure out, to see, you know, how we would make the branding and, you know, get it right. And we launched and it was, um, it was a big deal. Actually, I mean, it, it, it worked right away. And it, it, it's something that, um, we've seen like traction, uh, coming month over month and growing, like selling a lot of coffee every month. And, um, and then we are, you know, like, uh, it's almost like over two years now, um, and we see, you know, there's a lot of challenges, things have changed a lot again, uh, from COVID to now, 
uh, and it's a constant uh, evolution, you know, um, as an entrepreneur, but also owning a brand and try to adjust yourself in a in, in changing environment, like nonstop changing environment. So that's the long story short. <laughs> I'm 100% with you. I'm sort of, I have the same history, at least starting from 2015. I'm also started different businesses since 2001, but 2015, as you said, the golden era of Teespring was so easy, was so yeah. cheap on Facebook. So everyone was happy. And then also venturing in Shopify and since then with Shopify. Now, as you said, a lot of pivoting, a lot of changing, constant learning never stops. Um, Google, Facebook, and all the others are changing the rules by the day, and then you have to comply and go from there. Now, obviously, I'm talking to a lot of small and medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and they're sometimes struggling with the speed that things are changing. Um, so they have problems keeping up. Last year, it was iOS 14.5. Email marketing became more difficult, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, your um, brand, Gothrider, sort of incorporates all the learnings of 20 years, I reckon. So you had a bit of a um, good start there, of course, with all the experience you have, which a lot of people do not have. What do you think are the most critical skills for someone in the business right now or coming into the e-commerce business now, what they need to look for to, to get started or to have a head start? I, I think that the, the one, of the one of the most important thing now, and you know, when I compare to uh, big brands, let's say, that have been there for a long time and they want to start e-commerce versus the newcomers. I think newcomers have more chances to succeed. And that's what we see also about new brands disturbing like the space is because they don't have boundaries, actually. You know, they, they're not stuck into one thing. So I, I remember, you know, uh, last year we consulted a, a $40 million brand selling tea. Uh, they have been there like for all over like two decades at least and they wanted like to start selling online but they had all this misconception and all those things that they're too um too much used to do in the traditional world and they don't want to change that for the digital work and you see like new brands that never touch or never been in retail, let's say, you know, and they're newcomers in the tea business and they're breaking everything and they have like good success. And that's because, you know, they're not living in boundaries and they're, um, they try, you know, they try nonstop new stuff without thinking, you know, is this going to hurt me or not? They just try it. And I think that's a bit the, the mindset actually that uh, either like old brands or new brands have to do is, you know, it's a total, total different world. You know, being in retail is one thing, being online is one thing. And they are two, from my perception, two different businesses that needs to be managed totally differently. Yeah, yes, there's a bridge in between because of the brand, you know, and the, the recognition from the customers and the experience that needs to, to stay there. But the rest, it's, it has to be managed totally differently. I see that sometimes from businesses will come from a brick and mortar perspective, moving over. And as you said, they're carrying over their mindset from their traditional retail business. And sometimes it's surprising because their online customer can be a completely different person than somebody who walks into a store. So you might have a different audience, actually. And so I think it takes a lot of um, openness um, to, to go that route. Now, exactly. when it comes to to products like coffee, like tea, like perfume, like candles. All of these things are very difficult to sell online because you can't smell and taste them. How do you deal with that? So that's totally true. I think that there's um, there's different kind of consumable products that will be more difficult and other less. I think like you, you mentioned one perfume. Perfume is very personal. It's probably one of the most difficult product to sell online. Um, and that's funny because I'm uh, consulting a brand right now that uh, they are in, into perfume. And the goal is really, really to find at first um, as much as information as possible about their persona. And one thing I've always think, I mean, I always um, try to put myself is always in the customer's shoes. But to be in those customer's shoes, you have to survey you know you have to have a very big and deep understanding so what you think might be good for you might not be good for 
um, the customer that you think you're going to go after. So one uh, simple, um, I would say, uh, work we're doing with them is to try to, even like if they have their own ID, they create like the formula, let's say for the perfume and all this kind of thing already because of their own, based on their own taste. Um, the goal is to to um, challenge them and, and say, you know, okay, this is your ID of your customer based on your own personal experience and your own taste, but it is the right customers. So the goal is to do um, surveys around those assumptions you have and to, to try to validate it at first and to see, you know, if this is, is this the right fit? Then after that, you know, take a sample of all those people that survey and try to send samples and to see, okay, from the survey we did and the perception you had and from the sample test you did, it is the right fit or not. Then after that, if you see that there's some correlation with all those answers, you can finally figure out who is your potential real personal and customer set then after you're going to be able to go after it. Now, again, the problem with perfume is so personal that the chance of missing the target is really big, is really big. Now in coffee, it's it's very different because coffee is um, a commodity uh, and, uh, and as beer or wine, as it used to be like over 20 years ago, a lot of people don't make the difference. You know, they are going to more be attached to what I would say, um, what's behind the brand, what's behind the values, um, you know, maybe the origin, maybe I would say, but it's not as strong as personal as, uh, as the perfume. The coffee and like the tea or all this kind of thing are all about tasting. One thing we I found out, and that was a big mistake I did at first because, you know, we are always thinking when we're launching uh, an e-com, you know, to do an MVP, you know, so we're looking to have a minimal viable product, very simple, probably one SKU, and that was our case, one SKU, so we don't have to invest too much and do a test market. The good thing is we, we were, I would say, like up to a point lucky where with that one SKU, we nailed it in terms of taste and flavor and people love the product. Now, what I found out during are you know years now two years of testing is we should have probably launched three different kind of taste slash roast let's say because for some people you know like let's say in coffee they like it much more coarse you know strong and others might not like this this kind of taste some will probably like much more fruitful let's say and all this kind of thing so you you need to have like some sort of a range of taste where people can fit in because yes they love the brand yes they love the designs or all this kind of thing or the mission or whatsoever but if they don't like the taste at the end they will not you know they might buy it one time but they will not buy it the second time and with coffee because of the margin you know even if you have like big margin the amount of that margin is so small <laughs> that it's hard to make dollars or being like profitable on the first sale. So it's a game of LTV lifetime value and repeat, you know, so as much as you can get those buyers by a second time, which most of the time will be where you start breaking even or making money, you get them a third time. So it's really, really a long-term game because of the economic factor of that kind of product. Now, there's other products where you might have more, I would say, mar uh, not margin, but uh, uh, margin, but dollar value of those margin, like let's say shampoo, or I don't know, like some kind of cosmetics that are more in the high end um, and, and other products where, where you can be profitable on the first sale. But that's always a struggle in consumable products. You know, I'm looking at some people I've worked with, let's say that are in the hot sauce business. You know, hot sauce is a growing market. In the United States, it's over like $5 billion value in terms of uh, the market size and share. And 
the biggest issue again is like you're selling a hot sauce, I don't know, like between uh, nine and fourteen dollars, but I mean it's gonna cost you like probably twenty dollars to get that first sale for that first customer. So how are you going to overcome that? And especially, are you going to buy a hot sauce every month? For a lot of people, cons consuming hot sauce, you might try a bunch and you're gonna put that in the in the fridge and it's gonna stay there like for a couple months you know, before you refill. So the, the frequency is very different. The lifetime is very different. And one thing I found, I mean, with, with a lot of thought after is there some models that just are not made for e-commerce. They're just made for retails. Yes, e-com will be there as a support, maybe for branding, but you will never be profitable or sustainable on the, uh, the e-com side because economically, it doesn't make sense, doesn't work. You know, even, even if you remove the cost of acquiring customers and you say, you know what, I mean, we're building that whole strategy based on influencers, athletes, and all this kind of thing, you know, they will cost you money anyway, you know, they will cost you money in terms of free products and all this kind of thing. And even if you bring them in, I mean, there's all there, there will always be a, a certain cost that will you know make it barely profitable in, in that term. So it's why today it's more it's important more than ever than not only see you know that we're only D two C, you know we have to see all those channels that can give us like some support and ultimately you know all those consumable products needs to be on retail because I mean retail is not dead a lot of people think it's it's dead you know but it's not at all it's there and it's there to stay probably longer than we than we think so it's um you know so that's that's the thing about you know consumable products um and the kind of category you are there will be always a challenge there that's for sure <laughs> You know, I've got a, a lot of gold nuggets in there. Now you're quite right. I mean, I get clients that are coming from Amazon and want to go and Shopify because Amazon doesn't give you all the data, specifically mm -hmm. if you want to build up your own customer list or your email list and all of this. And then obviously also the other way around, they have a good shop and then they wander over to Amazon to just reach a bigger audience. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are obviously, if they are big enough and if they become interesting, for Walmart, for instance, venturing off into retail and then really going big. And I think you're quite right there. If you want to grow big with consumable products, then you need to be in brick and mortar. You need to be in the retail space because otherwise online, it will be very difficult. Talking about your brand, um, obviously you have a very good branding. Um, the value proposition is always is something that I have to start with my clients with really from scratch because most of the time they don't have the value proposition right. Now you have really built a brand here. I just want to give a, a example for, for the listeners and viewers is Ghost Rider has a coffee which is called Gasoline, Grease and Beaster Bunny. So these are really like badass names. And I think that also <laughs> identifies with, with your audience. What was the strategy when you started doing brand building? So the, the strategy was probably a way around, uh, 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 the opposite way around of how people start. Usually people start with their products and they try to find the audience for it. We, because of the origin of Gothrider and the drop shipping and the data we got and the time I spent into understanding that audience, I decided to do the opposite. So I said, you know, I have that audience that I now know well, uh, and I still need to know more about it because there's some sort of things that, you know, needs to be figured out. And I think that's, that's the, the thing is being, um, it's being obsessed with an audience first. That's the first thing. And then once you're obsessed with an audience, it's where you start understanding what they like, um, and, and what they need also, and in which I would say world they're living. And that's how we we came in with you know those names uh, and also about you know what people were looking for. Now there's some I would say thing we 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 taught and didn't work out, or there's things that uh, were not adapted at first, and we had to adapt 
after, but because of knowing that audience is easier to overcome uh, those challenges. So one thing is, you know, uh, about Godfather is, um, first of all, one of our mission is to educate now people around, you know, coffee and other products that will come in later. But we always position ourselves after we, we, we stop drop shipping as a lifestyle business. So being a lifestyle business is about, I mean, not lifestyle for me, but a lifestyle for the customer actually uh, is what they're doing in their day, you know? So the morning, and that's one thing we have to try to identify when we're building a persona is training, like taking like 24 hours a day, what they're doing and seven days a week. And then after all the whole year, what they're doing. So we know that our customers, uh, a good part of it, you know, they start their day by drinking coffee. So that, that's a no brainer. So we have coffee for them. Then after that, what they're doing, you know, in the, in the afternoon. So we have identified, you know, a couple of products that can be fit that they're not available yet, but they will be in the future, what they're doing during their day and what they're doing at night. So another thing we found out is like in the summer, especially, our customers love to do barbecue stuff, you know, outside. So definitely this is something that we're working on and we'll come with a barbecue line. We started with hot sauce, barbecue sauce to test the market, getting like some feedback. Um, and also, you know, after what they're doing during like, you know, their weekend. So we know we have a lot of motorcyclists, so they're going for a ride. So how we can um, help them during their ride, their, their ride to keep, let's say, wake up, uh, to have the good accessories for them during that ride, um, where they can they can fulfill. You know, in the future, I would see our Godfather coffee or coffee um, ready to drink in a convenience store. You know, so when they're on the ride, they stop. I don't know, like the gas station, they can grab. You know, probably one of those product or any other side products that you know make make feel them good for the continuing the ride. You know, and th that's all the mind the, the the mindset of the idea I have about the brand is how I can follow them in their journey. You know, and through accessories, t-shirt, and all this kind of thing for sure. That's part of the the glo the 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 global I would say strategy either in terms of marketing, but in, either in terms of, um, you know, making them feel good about uh, the brand. So, and on the other side, when I see a lot of people uh, doing, um, launching, uh, I would say, um, a store or a business, they always come with, oh, I have this product ID. And that's the hardest part because you have this product ID. You don't know if there's going to be a fit or not, or you don't know enough well your persona. So we ran a lot of surveys, I can tell you, we ran a lot of survey to know what they do, uh, what they are, what's their work, what the, what kind of game do you play? Let's say, you know, like a lot of people in our niche love to play poker, let's say, you know, uh, some are, you know, love video games as well. Um, you know, they like to drink whiskey. Uh, they, you know, all this kind of stuff we're trying to go and we're doing surveys, um, you know, at least like three, uh, three to four times a year where we try to gather as much information for from past customer again and from new as well. So we can always stay on the edge about understanding and see, you know, what are the correlation with those information and what we're doing and how we can improve that uh, in our products, in our offers, and even in customer experience and customer service as well, you know. So that's our the, the key part. Okay. <laughs> Talking about coffee on the road and motorcyclists, so I have to raise my hand. I just come, came back from 8,000 kilometers through African countries, and my coffee was always with me, but that was sort of a shitty instant coffee whatsoever. <laughs> so please follow up on that. I will be one of your customers. But <laughs> I already can, <laughs> can see that um, with all the experience, the focus on data is very, very high. And I think with a lot of people, it's not high enough. They're not going deep enough to find out who is really my customer and what other segments of the market can I attract. Now, in the last year, the market has specifically when it comes to marketing platform, Facebook ads, Google ads, and so on and so forth, has really been turned upside down. I'm always saying the good times are over for now. They might come again, but it's not as easy as it was like one and a half, two years yeah. ago. What kind of marketing channels or marketing strategy do you have to, to get the word out? So the so here's the reality uh, first. Reality is... Um, 
Facebook's still a platform of choice at first to try and test everything. So you 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 know forget about the noise out there, TikTok, Snapchat, whatsoever, you know, Facebook's still number one in terms of understanding and gathering data and as well start testing products is the most efficient way. Even if you don't have, let's say, all the data because of iOS 14 and all this kind of thing, it's still the the the, the platform the platform of choice. And yeah, sure, Google and others which have a lot of data there. Now, one thing that we've seen is um, is because of that and because having lack of information, it's harder now to figure out, you know, your um, what works actually. And and visually in terms of reporting, it's harder as well because you're missing like probably 50 percent of the data that you can get, you know, no, that's that's one thing. And one of the metric we're looking at. And we try to blend that and divide that, I would say, uh, by the, um, the old customers is what we call the NCPA or the new, the new CAC, actually, you know, the new cost per acquisition. So which means that every new customer that it is not in your database, you try to figure out the cost. And this is a good indicator, actually, of how the market is globally based on your ads you're doing for sure if you have like shitty ads and, and you don't you know test often i mean this will be highly impacted as well but as long as you keep it you know good you don't have to be excellent but good um that will be relevant and one thing we've seen is like during this year we went you know at super i would say like our cost at a certain point was you know over 60 dollar to acquire one new customers and as low as 28 when we started you know like two years ago acquiring a, a customers was about like 14 bucks so you can imagine that curve like for 14 to 60 it's like four times more uh within like almost like two years and now we're in the middle so that's very very hard uh, and i'm i'm uh i'm blending all the um i would say uh, the the data, the ad spend we have. Uh, so that's what I was saying at the beginning. You know, it's, it's very important to have a good understanding of your business and your product and where you are. You are, you know, are you, a, if you're a consumable product, you know, uh, the game is on, you know, RFM, you know, which means like uh, recency, frequency, and uh, the, the monetary value. And also, you know, you have your lifetime into that. So that's the game, the name of the game. Now, if you are, uh, again, a, a product where you can, you know, you have much more dollar margin, it's it, it's feasible. You know, I see a lot of brands, you know, either like selling wallets and all this kind of thing, they're able to scale and always be profitable on their first sale, which is great. Now in that space, that saying is, one thing we found out, and now it's where I moved to TikTok because that's <laughs> all the crazes on TikTok now, is TikTok um, winning demographic to sell online products. I would say like winning demographic is anything that is related to women first, you know, so cosmetics, hair uh, stuff, and all this kind of thing. That I would say that is mainly where it is winning now. Now TikTok is a great, I would say. Um, leverage into the brand. Um, one one of the things we because we we're testing more and more, and one thing we've seen is like a lot of people that are going to see our videos on TikTok, they don't click on the on the on the button to to go to your page, and that's very problematic because. And I know they're working on that. They came like with new kind of banners to enhance the visibility of that, but. What one thing we see because it's so fast, it's so short in terms of consuming the product, the, the the videos that people don't give too much time. So that's why the hook is very important. The videos and how you structure your videos. But now from there, for from an e-commerce perspective, one thing we've seen is like a lot of the traffic. Uh, we've seen a direct correlation. So more we spend on TikTok, more we have sales from Google Google brands keyword okay. and 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 we we did test actually we we stopped all ads from TikTok and we seen oh 
sales are not coming anymore from Google ads. What's happening there, you know? And we had like, like this burst. And each time we got this burst, we're related to new videos who are launching on TikTok. So, and like, you know, it's hard, you know, following that kind of tracking, uh, even like if you have UTMs or all this kind of thing, all the attribution is set in Google Analytics or third-party software. It's very hard to figure this out. But the only way was to just like, you know, switch on, switch off and see, you know, what was happening on the other side. And that's where I see that, okay, so TikTok is good really at leveraging your, your brand awareness, but not like the traditional awareness branding, like the billboards and all this kind of thing. There's performance, real performance attached to that, but it will not come directly yet from the ads itself. Now, now there's more tests to do there for sure. You know, we, we haven't test all angles and all tricks and, you know, how we can enforce call to actions into videos and all this kind of thing, you know, or in, in, uh, inserting scarcity uh, and all this kind of thing to, to, to push people to buy. But at the same time, my, when you look at the platform, you don't want to, you don't want to get into um, a sales pitch too much in, in, in TikTok. It's all about education. So that's one thing we're trying to do is we're trying to find an angle with the latest video we, we did is it's a bit that it's like we're trying to find an angle where we can answer the questions of people what they have, we can present the product and give like the values of properties and what they are. Um, and it's more in that angle than trying to sell. And one of our best seller actually and I mean video that we got the best impact. Um, is a content creator coming from a content creator. And he was like super lay down, super cool. Very, you feel like he's very accessible. It was not those kind of content creator where you feel like there's going to be, they're going to try to sell you something, you know? So that was another signal where I say, okay, I mean, we need to have like those, you know, you can have like those very, corporate-like kind of videos that shows the brand like you see on TV or even on YouTube, that's okay. But that will never drive as much traffic than someone where you feel you know him and you have a, almost a conversation, you know, he's explaining, hey, my friend, you know, I just got that and look at this and, you know, oh, I mean, uh, you know, they're, and, and, and they're taking care of me. And, you know, you, you have like those kind of um, proximity actually, you know. And um, and that's what I feel that where you can get out the most of TikTok is having that kind of feeling when you have like that kind of proximity with the content creator instead to having like, oh, uh, TikTok made me buy this and, uh, you know, okay, you know, we know it's going to be a sales pitch and uh, here we go. Okay, now that shows already that building up a brand is a long term game. So it's nothing that you can do overnight. You have to really work on that. You have to find your audience. And obviously, you have to find the right voice and tone to talk to people. Always, no one wants to be sold to. And then find a way. And it might be a multi step process before, as you said, people are watching you on on TikTok, but they're buying then from Google. So it's a little bit coming around full circle. But obviously, as a marketer, you need to take that into consideration. Our coffee break is sort of coming to the end. Just one question, obviously, with your brand. How do you structure your team? Um, obviously, you're not doing everything on your own. I hope not. So <laughs> uh, who's helping you? What kind of different parts do you have in your business? So the, the truth is I do a lot by myself, um, but it's something I'm working to to split the work. Now, I have a team that takes care of creatives, uh, reaching out the, the content creators for me. Um, I would say that's where the most of the work comes from. Um, we have uh, a new email team that is coming in uh, to to basically reinforce the flows also because we found, you know, through the time we found also behaviors have changed, you know, uh, let's say only on the Yabin and cart, you know, now people knows about the tricks and, you know, uh, you know, you, you, you try to, to mimic a, a, a sales, then after that, anyway, they're going to get a, the, the, the discount. So we, we're changing that also. Uh, another thing, um, so the production part, so the, the thing is, I don't roast myself the coffee, thanks God. So we have a roaster partner for that. I have a designer uh, in my team that takes care of all that cold, cold graphics uh, designs there for a brand. Uh, I have a fulfillment 
Um, we do fulfillment actually in house, but I have a, an employee in house that takes care of all the fulfillment uh, for that. So the, the the team is lean, still like very lean now uh, until we break a certain, uh, I would say, goal. Once we get that uh, breaking goal, that's where I'm going to start, you know, putting like uh, more people around um, to put myself uh, in a different position where I can, you know, do deals, you know, especially like for retails uh, and events as well, you know, to be more uh, on the field than inside uh, the business. And, um, that, you know, I don't have like a, a perfect timeline because uh, it's, it's a long game for me. But uh, one thing I know is like more and more will be active uh, here and there, uh, better it's going to leverage also by itself. So the thing about brand, when you think about building a brand, is nothing is not the same mindset as thinking a brand to sell it as flipping business or to have a a business that just makes you your pay, you know, your uh, your daily paycheck. So it's really three different ways of seeing it. And you know, I have a plan of you know for for fifteen years from now. You know, it's not that three years. Okay, I'm gonna sell and thank you bye. No. I'm here like for the next 15 years and then we'll see, you know, if I still there and I enjoy great, I will still there. If I don't, I mean, I will find something else differently, but for now I enjoy and I love what I do. <laughs> that sounds good. A couple of things there, obviously, yes, you have to do everything in your business on in the, in the beginning on your own to understand the process. Yeah. And I always say, once you understand the process, then outsource, give it to someone who's better than you. And for sure you will find someone who will be better than you. Uh, just that's the goal the yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah i understand the principles but there's someone who can do it better than me and then obviously at some point you want to start as you said building or working on your business and stopping working in your business mm. so very good plan from your side phil Sam, thanks um for for this i mean people have to listen like three times to this episode because there's so much good stuff in there where can people find out more about you yeah first of all they can uh, go on my uh, Twitter account. Uh, so it's twitter.com slash, slash Phil Kipriano. Uh, they can follow me also on our, you know, uh, Google br uh, or a Goth Rider brand page on Facebook. Uh, we do live often. We even like do like giveaways. Um, and uh, yeah, or, you know, you can always try to reach me out through uh, direct messenger. I, I will be more than pleased to uh, to get to to get a chat with you <laughs> excellent i will put the links in the show notes and people can reach out directly sounds cool. great thank you so much, Phil. Um, all the best with your brand and i will continue following on that one thank you very much klaus <laughs> bye, bye hey klaus here before you go i would like to invite you to become part of the e-commerce merchant pro community to get actionable advice from other shopify merchants who already have achieved what you are aiming for our community is a safe place to actively grow your online retail business with the support of the most amazing and helpful group of e-commerce entrepreneurs behind you. Running a Shopify business is tough. Don't do it alone. Join us now. It's free. You will find the link in the show notes. Also, if you think your online store has conversion or marketing issues and you would like to have a fresh set of eyes on your business, then drop me an email at klaus at klauslauter.com and let me know a little bit about your business. It might be beneficial for you to have me look over your store, offers, emails, and ads, and get an unbiased outside perspective and guidance to help you make most of your online business. And finally, if you enjoy the show, please rate and review in the app that you're listening so that I can get bigger and more impactful guests on the podcast. Thank you as always for tuning in today. I appreciate you. Until next time, and I talk to you soon.